I'm gonna be careful because these old weaver bird nests are absolute perfect homes for the Cape Cobra. Stretching from South Africa north through Botswana, Namibia, and all the way to the Congo is a parched expanse of a savanna and sand known as the Kalahari Desert. The rolling red sand dunes seem to go on forever, broken only here and there by flat, sun-baked pans. Very few people dare to live here. Existence is harsh. Running out of gas can be a fatal disaster in the desert. I've got an old 4x4 with not much in the tank. When it runs out, I'll have to survive alone amongst the cobras and the scorpions. But they are not my greatest foe. It's blisteringly dry. Not surprising for a desert. And sandstorms are not only common, they're deadly. But it's the heat that's the killer. Two days ago here, it hit 42 degrees Celsius. That's 107 degrees Fahrenheit. And the temperature of the sand can reach an amazing 75 degrees Celsius. That's 167 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot. But the heat doesn't deter the legendary Kalahari lion from surviving here. This is not a place where I can let my guard down. Uh, see, here we go. Once my gas runs out, the clock starts to tick on my week of survival. Ah, that's it. That's the end of the diesel. Oh, man. Now, the safety crew heads off and leaves me alone to film the ordeal myself. One week, alone in the Kalahari Desert. I can tell you this much, this is not the time to panic. Broken down in the middle of a scorching hot desert, this bucket of bolts here is gonna be a deadly heat trap. So all I'm gonna do now is get over to some trees and wait out the heat of the day. For centuries, the Bushmen of the Kalahari have survived by sitting still during the heat of the day. And it isn't taking long for me to figure out why. The heat is oppressive. As the sun's fading, I'm gonna go back to the truck and sleep in it tonight. There's no point in me sleeping on the ground here. This place is crawling with scorpions. Check out all the holes. Big scorpion hole. Scorpion hole. Scorpion hole. Scorpion hole. Scorpion hole. Scorpion hole. And this one is massive. See, the thing is, the scorpion is as wide as its hole. That's incredible. When the sun goes down in the desert, it's instant relief. That sun is relentless. For me, I have to think about my priorities now. The first priority is just to get through this night in the back of a pickup truck. It's still quite warm. My challenges this week, oh, they're pretty obvious. The heat and the thirst brought about by that heat. And uh, tomorrow morning I'll get up real early, see what I've got, take stock of my supplies and what I can make use of. This is where I ended up spending the night in the cab of the truck. 
the sun is just about to come up and as you can hear my head's all clogged up with some kind of sinus congestion so you can't pick the times that you're going to fall into peril and I came out here knowing I had this head cold anyway but just got to deal with it. So what I'm going to do now is check and see what came with this truck, what I have that I can survive with. You would think it would be a simple matter to rip apart a vehicle, but in fact, with only a multi-tool at my disposal, it can be pretty tough. Most of the nuts and bolts are too big anyway, or they're rusted on. But as is typical with a work truck, it's full of useful junk. Couple of buckets. Wow, I've got groceries. Oh, good. Some instant coffee. No coffee pot, not much water. Sure. Empty can of pop. Another empty can of pop. That'll be a tease. Some empty cups. <laughs> a sugar container from a restaurant. Now, why would anybody have one of those? I don't really know. We'll see. But for real, jar of peanut butter and a can of jam. <laughs> Never had so much luxury. There was no option. I had to come out here with water. Otherwise, if I'd been here in the Kalahari Desert in the middle of summer, without water, I would have perished inside of two or three days, guaranteed. You need at least a gallon of water per person per day to survive in this kind of heat. So I've got 20 liters of water here. That's basically about four days supply. When I survived one time in the Arctic, the locals there gave me some raw seal meat to take in with me. And here, the locals have also given me something to bring in to eat. Partway through the week, an ostrich egg. So I'm gonna hold on to this See how much luck I have on my own first, and crack this when the need arises. Down there is where the illusion of a mirage happens. It's just a big, wide, flat pan. There's not an ounce of water down there. But with the sun plays tricks on your eyes and it looks like it could be a lake. It should come as no surprise that exposure to the sun is deadly, and I need to find protection from it. Here, that means nothing more than a few small shade trees, each at least a half a mile apart. It's barely 10 o'clock and it's uh, 35 degrees Celsius in the shade. So there's a real reason why the Bushmen of the Kalahari don't move much in the middle of the day. I can't get over how intensely hot it is. All I can do is lay here, and I'm feeling waves of heat sort of blow in. One thing I should definitely not do is take any of my clothing off. You, in fact, preserve more of your moisture by keeping fully clothed. You don't uh, wick away perspiration off your body as quickly that way. So it might feel a little cooler to take a shirt off. I mean, aside from the obvious huge risk of sunburn, if you keep your shirt on, it helps to actually keep more moisture in your body. And <laughs> it feels like I'm in a slow cooker. Oh boy. On the second day of my ordeal in the Kalahari Desert, survival comes down to hiding from the sun and paying attention to the small details before they become big problems. It's really important that whenever possible, you dump the sand out of your shoes and never, ever walk in bare feet. The, uh, you'll end up with alkali burns on your feet. Your thirst is not enough to determine whether or not you need to drink water. If all you do is satisfy your thirst, you can still bring yourself down to dehydration. If you uh, ration your water down to two quarts a day when you know you have more, 
you could be inviting disaster. It's almost controversial. Some people say, don't ration your water, drink it, drink what you need, drink the gallon or so a day. Other people who get out there also say though, yeah, but you know, after a few days, you run out of water, it would be nice to at least be sipping some water than uh, to have guzzled it all down early on. I can lose up to about 15% of my body weight in water and still be all right. After that, it gets very dangerous. But just the same, after only 5%, you start to get nauseous. Six to 10%, and you start to get dizzy and headaches. And after that, you get the dry mouth, your body turns bluish, it gets hard to speak, even to walk. So staying hydrated out here is critical to my survival. And no small task in the middle of the Kalahari Desert in the middle of the summer. And there is no substitute for water. You can hear about using different liquids or alcohol or whatever. No substitute. It's water that you need. In this heat, I move slowly while I work on some of the supplies I pulled from the truck. This is the rope that was on the back of the truck. It's just too big for anything I might have a need for right now. So I'll see if I can make it smaller. So now that I've got this separated into three ropes, I can take it down even more into smaller rope and then down even into string. Protection in a survival situation is vital from the elements and from dangerous critters. It's not paranoia for me to fashion together a spear to protect me from the deadly Cape Cobra. They can be aggressive and move fast when they want to. So hopefully this will work if I need it to. If a snake comes along, like this, and I've got this on the end of a pole, I can trap it, hold the head down. It becomes a bit of a protection device, but it's also gonna be used for hunting. Even in one of the hottest places on the planet, fire is still important for my survival. If I am able to get a fire going, I'm going to need to be able to travel with it. I'm just working on a fire bundle. Going through this riddle, prickly dried grass to get the dead stuff. Leave the green stuff behind. I grab some vinyl from the truck to use to wrap around it. And there's some dung around. I don't know what kind of dung it is, but it's an ungulate, so it's a grass eater, and it'll probably work pretty well. It'll hold it in there tight. And you do want it to be very tight because you don't want it to burn. You just want it to smolder for as long as you have to travel. Well, in the fading sunlight, now that it's taken its toll on me for the day and it's losing some of its strength, I'm gonna see if I can't get something else from this uh, truck that I can make use of. got a piece of the fuel line. With any luck, there'll still be some fuel in this line, because even though your uh, engine runs out of gas, there's often just uh, little tiny drips of residual fuel, and the line is where they might settle. So if I want to be able to start a fire, and I need some gas, this might be all I have. I'm going to put it right into this guy here. Yep. And I can do one better. Oh yeah, stealing oil from the uh, oil filter. That should keep this thing smoldering really nicely. So I've got my fire bundle and it's uh, been impregnated with gas and oil. And uh, all I have to do is get a spark into it and uh, get it uh, burning on the top tomorrow. And with any luck, I'll be able to travel with fire for when I get out of here. I can see by looking in the viewfinder of the camera that my face is getting awfully red. Oof. I'm gonna be a piece of toast by the end of this week. This is a major score. These beans, I already know from research, 
be edible. Little, as they call them, pups. We call them seeds. The tree is known locally as the camel thorn tree. <sighs> this is great news. Heat stroke and heat exhaustion can kill you. It's not just a matter of overheating. It's a deadly process of your body not being able to cope. And eventually, or sometimes in short order, it shuts down. I feel like I'm overheating. Like I might have heat exhaustion. I, uh, I'm feeling pretty nauseous. And I, and I feel like I can't cool down. My body's just radiating so much heat. I sacrificed a bit of water to, uh, put on my bandana and, uh, to get around my carotid arteries because that's what you want to do you want to you want to cool your blood down oh. I'm gonna have to keep a real close watch on this if it gets worse I have to call this off. I stopped taking the temperature out there today at when it hit 60 degrees Celsius in the sun. the second night in the Kalahari Desert, and the most dangerous night I have ever faced. For hours I have flirted on the edge of near fatal heat exhaustion. Obviously, maybe I pushed it a little too hard today. Even though I sat in the shade for a long time, I mean, it was like being in a worldwide oven. This is the toughest night of survival I've ever experienced but I'm rewarded by awakening to a desert protected by clouds that seem to promise rain. And I can feel energy return to me as I prepare for my third day of survival. This is completely and radically unusual. I don't get days like this during the summer in the desert. And yet I've got what to me looks like a generally overcast, rainy, spitting kind of day. And that's fantastic. It means that I can travel without killing myself in the heat. So I'm gonna uh, finish up and uh, get my gear together, get a few more things from the uh, truck, and uh, ooh, I have to try and get that fire bundle burning. And, uh, and then I hope this holds out. It could last all day, it would suit me fine. It's raining and it feels great. I should see if I can find a way of capturing this water if it really starts to rain. As long as the wind doesn't come up, I've got myself hopefully a bit of a rain catch. It's back to the truck to see what else I can salvage and use for survival. I can use these for my next trick. Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. Oh yeah, all right. Let's get that fire bundle going. And it's starting to rain all at the same time. Woohoo! Almost set the truck on fire, mind you. The jar of peanut butter wasn't actually full. There was only a few tablespoons in it, and it's not the nicest thing to eat in this heat. Mm. I'm sad to say that I don't think there's gonna be any more rain coming in and I've got to get going, so. However, as small of a, an amount it might be, it's still better than nothing. Mm. Ah, bonus water. Thank you, clouds. 
After grabbing the salvaged items from the truck, I'm leaving this area. To make my way closer to the safety camp, I'll need to travel a few hours across the desert. Avoiding the sand as much as possible will help, as it's much easier to walk around the hard-packed ground by the grass, but it means walking through very active Cape Cobra territory. After many hours of walking, I need to stop. I've only spotted a few shade trees here and there, so on this lonely dune, I'll set up camp. As strange as it may seem, I still feel the need for fire, even here in the desert, and the smoldering fire bundle has worked perfectly. You know what? I guarantee, when this storm comes in over top of me, it's gonna be going like crazy. It's gonna be blowing like mad, so it's all calm. Sun shining over here, it's black there. I better go batten down the hatches or I'm gonna regret it. Yeah. This is pretty much my bedroll. And I'll just keep it hidden away to see what happens with this storm. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like my storm's gonna come in. I was hoping for some relief by getting rained on, but going all around me, but not coming over top of me. Well, it's a beautiful full moon, but I've got a bit of a conundrum. First, the wind is blowing hard from the north, and I'm protected where I am, my little fire. Then there's no wind. Now, the wind is blowing really hard from the south, so there's systems that are swirling around. And, uh, of course, with it blowing hard from the south, I've got to watch my fire doesn't take off on me and blow off into the grasslands. Last night I was almost succumbing to heat exhaustion and tonight at 27 degrees Celsius I'm, uh, I'm, I'm chilled, I'm cooling, cooling down. So if I stay here, well, you know, I'm underneath a big shepherd's tree. Not a good place to be in terms of uh, Cape Cobras. They come through these trees, they like to go up into the trees, they, they rest up in the trees and uh, when it's humid like this, they'll be active, so... I think this is going to be one of those prop up the uh, backpack and sleep uh, sitting up nights. I've survived through heat exhaustion, felt the relief of a desert rain, been chilled by last night's cooling winds, and it's only been three days out of seven surviving in the Kalahari Desert. So this is where I ended up spending my night. I had to come over here in the middle of the night, be protected from the winds. So now I've just got to regroup, figure out my priorities. I've got to get some food, so I want to get out hunting. Here, let me show you this weaver bird nest that the cobras like to live in. So it's not the safest location, but it's the only shade for miles. Just cracking this can of jam. It's day four now, peanut butter's long gone, and I could use some food. Oh, wow, pure sugar. I almost can't eat that. Oh, unfortunately that sugar's gonna make me want more water. Okay, all of this junk here, I scrounged from the truck. And I can use this stuff to make some traps. With these little containers to use, I have in mind one particular type of prey. See, it's really a simple matter of just creating a big hole for the scorpion to drop down into. You want it to be straight down as possible. I think time to put this peanut butter jar to use. You just sort of make it so that when he comes out the hole, he just drops right into the jar. Yeah. On the way in, not far from here, I did see some plants that will give me water. And it's a good thing because that's all there is left. It's a good thing that it cooled down as well. That's uh, saving me from having to drink too much water. If it had stayed like it did in those first couple of days when I was at the bigger sand dunes, I'd be out of water a long time ago. I'm not sure what would have happened. So I'm gonna look for those water plants and a few other things. That's 
the end of that. The hoses from the truck will work as excellent traps, a natural place for critters to hide in. Inside, I'm putting the jam that I found to be so ridiculously sweet that it almost made me sick. It'll be better utilized as bait. Setting traps or snares has nothing to do with guaranteeing me food, but it keeps my mind occupied, keeps my frustrations at bay, and gives me hope for a better situation. It's all about bettering the odds. <laughs> As the temperature climbs once again, it's time to hide in the shade and work on my spear. So many survival tools are made much easier with some knowledge of a simple knot system. So the string went up, like around, string went up, then I looped it back and pulled it, then I went around it some more, doot, 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 and here's the end. Put the end through the loop. Okay. Okay, so that's just loose through the loop. But the end of the loop comes out here. So this, you see, it'll pull and it will tighten that. And pull it down through. And that effectively locks off all of this banding here. Let's go hunting. There's a critter up in this nest. It gives me a chance to try out my new spear. I'm gonna be careful because these old weaver bird nests are absolute perfect homes for the Cape Cobra. Big old locust. Ooh, he's a big one. Dinner. You do have to be worried about uh, what bugs you eat. If they're brightly colored, and this guy's not. Or if they smell really bad, and this guy smells fine. Those are some things to watch out for. It likely means that they're toxic. This one I think is gonna be just fine. I hear him sizzling. It's kind of popping like popcorn. There we go. Now, here's the edible part. Mm. Bottoms up, eh? Hmm. It's always surprisingly good tasting. Feels like it's going to be gross. When you get in there, it's like, ah, oh, that's pretty good. The locust or big grasshopper, whatever it is, tasted great. But the sad part of this night is, it's the end of my water. Finishing my water changes everything. There is no greater struggle than staying hydrated in a survival situation in one of the hottest places in the world. Every desert is a place of wild temperature swings, and here is no exception. It has hit 65 degrees Celsius, 149 Fahrenheit, on the surface of the sand. The temperatures in a few days have gone from a high of 42 Celsius, 107 Fahrenheit in the shade to seven degrees Celsius, 44 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of the night. You know, I spent the beginning of this week absolutely dreading the rising of the sun, trying to get as much done as I could before it came above the horizon. And now, this morning, I find myself just praying for it to get above that horizon so I can warm up. I've been up all night just trying to stay warm by the fire. Well, there was a very serious reason why I took this mirror from the truck. If I find myself down and out, maybe bitten by a snake or stunned by a scorpion, maybe I can't get to my two-way radio backup system, or maybe it's not working, I can maybe flash somebody with this mirror. Now, if I wanted to get the attention of an airplane that might be looking for me, it's not that hard to do. You take your fingers and you put the airplane, just lodge them in behind your fingers. So if you're the airplane and I'm trying to spot you, and then you simply flash, in between your fingers, lining it all up with the airplane. It works like a charm. Now, airplane's up in the sky, line it up with the airplane, and 
flash away, pointing at the airplane in between your two spread fingers with the light. It can work really well. Pilot sees that, he knows where you are, and you're rescued. All thanks to one little mirror. There are a few ways to find or even make water in the desert. And if there was ever a time for me to pull out all the stops and rehydrate, it's now. Well, Bushmen would come and uh, cut into these roots and take the, the pulp and squeeze the water into their mouth. It feels juicy, feels wet. Oh yeah, look, you see the uh, moisture? Mm. Oh yeah, lots of juice. Like I just got a mouthful of juice from that little bit. Cover you over. Now I'm just going to keep coming back to this and taking chunks and sucking on the juice as much as possible. It's a pretty powerful full moon and I'm going to use it. The weaver bird nest by my shade tree is dried up and dead, but not far away there is a fully active nest and it presents a good opportunity for me to hunt some food. The birds might be small, but they nest in numbers. Thanks to the locust, I know the spear can work. Whether or not I can use it effectively is another story. Well, they're here. I just blew it. All right, this is nuts. I didn't sign on for this. I'm up because I'm freezing. It's the middle of the night and uh, it's quite cold. If I wasn't using all of the containers I have to try and catch scorpions, and if I had any water, I'd be uh, using the water in the container to boil me up something to get me warm. Maybe make some of that coffee. <laughs> oh, this is nuts. This wasn't what I was expecting. It's been more than 12 hours without water and five days with only a few dry beans and a locust in my stomach. I should have had some of those weaver birds last night. They're fast though, fast and small. <laughs> Sun feels good this morning. Take some chill out of my bones. Probably won't say that in about three hours. Okay. <laughs> hey, baby, this is, I got one. Let me show you. Got a second one. Yeah. And a third one. So that's three scorpions out of four traps. Very cool. One, two, three. And they've been there all night. They're not going anywhere. Let me, uh, there's a trap just down here. I'm going to check it. <laughs> I got another scorpion. All right, now comes the job of getting the scorpions out of these cups. I've got to cut off the stingers, which is where all of the poison is held. Humans can ingest poison from snakes and scorpions because it's simply a protein, but not if you have an ulcer or a stomach injury. For me, just the thought of the stinger getting stuck in my throat is enough. Wow, he pinches hard. Ooh, 
Ooh, this one's lively. There we go. My scorpion kebab. Sun's getting hot today. It's coming over top, but I'll be shaded here in just a moment. So let's put these guys on the grill, shall we? There we go. In spite of my frustration with not catching a weaver bird last night, half a dozen or maybe 10 of these scorpions probably might be very close to the same amount of nutrition as one of those tiny little birds anyway. Yeah. Breakfast. <laughs> Time to munch on some scorpions. A little gritty. You have to kind of do this quick and not think about it. The more you think about it, the more you won't do it. So, the ostrich egg, finally. Day five, I'm gonna cook it up. All right, hold in the top of the egg, and take a stick, break the uh, membrane, and I'm just gonna mush it up a bit inside. like one massive egg. That is so cool. Let's see how she tastes. Oh my gosh. Wow. That is amazing. Mm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> mm. This kind of rich food on a stomach with no liquid in it is dangerous. As of today, this is by far the best egg I've ever eaten. Not long after eating the egg, I'm feeling painful stomach acid from eating only the ostrich egg and having very little liquid going into my body. So I'm grabbing some of the charcoal from the fire to eat. It counteracts the acid and will calm my stomach. While I was resting in the shade and eating the ostrich egg, my fire died on me. I found a tiny piece of chocolate in a wrapper in one of my pockets. Okay. And I can put it to good use. Here it is. Just a little bit of chocolate. And apparently I can take the chocolate, polish up with the wax that's in the chocolate, polish up the bottom of this can, The idea is the concave nature of the bottom of the can should focus a beam of sunlight into the tinder and start it up just like you would use a magnifying glass. It's hard to do. There's light there and it's just coming back onto the grass right there. I'll leave the can and the tinder bundle in the sun to hopefully do its thing. While I wait, I'll see if I can make water by trapping leaves in one of the plastic bags from the truck. And I'm not gonna stop there because I also know a safe way to utilize my own urine to make water. Time to do the deed. Last bit of pee I can muster up. Urine is approximately 92% water, but the rest is harmful toxins that if ingested would overtoxify my blood and kill me. So if I could distill some pure water out of my urine, I might just get a small drink. All right, this is a urine still. Basically, all I did was create a depression to put the cup, and then I peed around that depression, then I put the cup in, covered over with this plastic, and 
As the urine evaporates, the distilled water will collect on the top of the plastic and drip down into the cup. At least, that's the hope. It's day six, and I've built two stills to hopefully collect water. And with my fire out, my only chance to get it back rests with the pop can, the intense sun, and some tinder. It's working. It's working, it's working, it's working. Amazing, absolutely amazing. I really didn't think I had a hope in anywhere of getting a fire going with a piece of chocolate, some sand, and the bottom of a pop can. I'm not gonna freeze tonight. Well, I, uh, sorry, I was really hoping, hoping to take you to the weaver bird nest tonight and uh, give it another shot at uh, catching some weaver birds. But after only 24 hours without water in this dry, dry heat, just sucking on the juice of a, the root of a plant for moisture, I'm, uh, I'm already uh, lightheaded and dizzy. I just didn't think I could make the, the long, long walk to where the weaver bird nest is. You know, it's not so much the heat, it's convection. The wind just blows almost constantly and it's always just sucking the moisture. Just sucks it right out of your body. And uh, I mean, it was still hot today. It got to the high 30s Celsius. It's high 90s Fahrenheit. And uh, it did its number. But uh, it's been 24 hours. We'll just have to see how I do tomorrow. And it's gonna get cold again tonight. I can feel it, but it's not as windy. So a little saving grace. Did I mention that scorpions are attracted to fire? They come in for the warmth. I hate thinking about stuff like that when I'm trying to sleep. I've been surviving under this old weaver bird nest for too long with the thought of a cobra hanging above my head. I figure I'll break it down now, just for some reassurance. I guess it's safe to say there was no cobras in that nest. Since I've been sleeping under it for a bunch of nights, that's reassuring. I'm just gonna go and check the, uh, the traps close to where I'm camped out here. What the heck? Well, what do you know? I caught some, uh, look at the size of that guy. <laughs> He's covered in jam and sand. This may look like a tasty meal to a starving person, but unfortunately, the reason they are so slow and seem worry-free of attack is that for most predators, they are toxic. A small amount of cyanide makes them mildly poisonous. Time now to check on my water collectors. First, the urine still. I'm just trying to get the condensation to finish dripping, you know? Down the plastic, let the bubbles of water collect, the drops of water collect, and drip into the cup. Little tiny bit of sand in there, but. Tastes like fresh, clean water to me. There is just a tiny bit of water that I've collected using this tree solar still. Well, for me right now, it's definitely better than nothing. Mmm. Oh, just that tablespoon of water and an ant or two. And uh, just to feel the moisture in my mouth, on my lips. That little bit, that helps. 
Dehydrated, I am suffering from migraines and debilitating headaches. I can't continue. Uh, truth is, I do need water really badly. It's almost been 48 hours without water, and with very little water, and my head is dizzy, and I'm a little disoriented, and my legs are wobbly. The safety crew camp is a few hours walk from here. <clears throat> so, I'm going home. Oh,